Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about air. Topic for the day is going to be pollution control. So one little objective for the day. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe in detail various strategies for reducing air pollution. So that's what we've got. We've been talking about air pollution up to this point. Today, we're going to start talking about some ways to reduce that air pollution. And with that idea in mind, I want you to realize that in the best case scenario, no pollution is the best pollution. While our video today is going to talk about ways to reduce pollution once it's already been created, I want you to realize that the best thing we can do is just not create pollution in the first place and also realize that burning anything creates pollution. So obviously we're not going to be able to get to a place where we don't burn any coal or any oil or at least not anytime soon when we're going to get there. So there is a choice to be made with the products that you burn, um, especially considering coal and oil. Coal and oil both have versions that have got low sulfur and high sulfur. Now, unfortunately, the versions of coal and oil that are low sulfur are the cheaper ones, the ones that are high. I just said that backwards. The versions of coal and oil that are high sulfur are the cheaper ones. The ones that are low sulfur are the more expensive ones. So it is good to reduce pollution first. If you must use sulfur, then using low sulfur fuels is going to be the best, but unfortunately that is going to be the most expensive option. So, so I just kind of wanted to throw that out there first. Now we're going to start talking about some specific things. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about reducing sulfur dioxide emissions, and this is particularly when burning coal. So there's a strategy for burning coal called fluidized bed combustion. In this situation, basically what you do is you take carb or you take coal, you grind up that coal, you vaporize the coal and you burn it in the presence of calcium carbonate. Now, that <clears throat> coal burned in the presence of calcium carbonate, the sulfur dioxide from that coal will combine with the calcium carbonate and form calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate can be used to make sheetrock. So you kind of get a two-for-one deal here when using fluidized bed combustion. The first thing is you remove the sulfur dioxide from the waste stream of gases. So it's going to reduce your pollution that's coming out of the smokestack. Also, you get the calcium sulfate needed to make sheetrock. So kind of have fluidized bed combustion in the back of your brain as a way to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions. And then we've got our nitrogen oxides, our NOx. And one way to reduce the emission of NOx is with proper burning conditions. Now, an interesting thing happens. If you burn fuels at a lower temperature, they will release fewer nitrogen oxides. And also, if you burn them with less air present, you are going to get fewer nitrogen oxides. Problem is, if you burn things at a lower temperature, they're not going to burn as efficiently, which means that you are going to get more particulates and you're going to get more carbon monoxide. So there's a fine balance to be walked um, for the burning conditions because if you burn at a high temperature, you get lots of nitrogen oxides, but fewer carbon monoxide and fewer particulates. If you burn in a lower temperature, you get less nitrogen oxide, but more carbon monoxide. So that's a kind of calculation that factory owners and runners and operators have to be aware of and take into account when they're trying to reduce their nitrogen oxide emission. Now, there are three actual technologies that I'm going to walk you through real quick. Excuse me. I'm going to walk you through these three technologies. And each of these technologies is aimed at pollution control after the waste gases have already been created. So, <clears throat> so you're going to go through your whole industrial process. Your industrial process is going to produce polluted gases. Those polluted gases need to be dealt with before they can leave the factory. So the first strategy I want to talk to you about is called a bag house filter. And essentially, it is a filter made out of how a house of bags. Here's what you get. You get your dirty air coming in. So it's gone through your whole industrial process. It is dirty. It is polluted. It's full of particulates. It's full of pollutants. It flows into the air inlet up through these pipes. Once it gets into these pipes, it has to flow out through these bags. As it flows through these bags, all of the particulates get trapped in the bags like coffee in a coffee filter. And then you got clean air that flows out the top. So this can remove almost 100% of particulate matter. So it's a pretty good uh, solution. One of the problems with it is all of the particulates that get caught in these bags and these bags themselves have to be disposed of later on. So while the particulates are not going into the air, 
they still become a part of the waste stream that has to be dealt with. Also, this uses a lot of energy in order to run. So while you are reducing your particulate matter coming out of this particular factory, you are still using energy in order to run the filter, and obviously using energy is going to create pollution somewhere else. Our second strategy I want to talk to you about is called an electrostatic precipitator. And again, this is for use after you have already created the polluted gas. So the way this one works is your polluted gases enter into this chamber. Now, the little tiny particulates in this gas are electrically charged. So what we do is we have a series of positive and negative electrodes in our baghouse filter. As the gases flow through, any particles that are positively charged will stick to the negative electrodes. Any particles that are negatively charged will stick to the positive electrodes, and then you get clean air out the other side. Now, all of these particulates that are collected obviously have to be cleaned off, and just like with the bag house filter, they have to be dealt with later on, probably put into a landfill. But this here would be another strategy for removing the particulate pollution from air. Then our last technology you need to know about is called a scrubber. Scrubbers have the ability to remove particulates and sulfur oxides. And the way these guys work is they are a tower. Dirty air flows in the bottom. Within the tower, you've got a bunch of misters, and the misters spray water onto the gas that is flowing through. Now the water, uh, sorry, the water interacts with the particulates, causes them to clump together and fall to the bottom. So it basically makes those particulates too heavy to flow up. They fall down to the bottom, forming a sludge, and then the sludge has to be dealt with later. Also in this process of wetting the particulates, um, some of the sulfur dioxide is removed. So dirty air in, you wet it with a mister, all the particulates and sulfur oxides fall down to the bottom, and then you get clean air that flows out of the smokestack. So make sure that you go through and know each of those three technologies. Make sure that you can discuss each one in detail and tell what they're used for and how they are used. And also recognize, like I said previously, each of these has the advantage of being able to clean uh, the pollution out of gas, but they also take a lot of energy to run themselves. So pollution is going to be pr uh, produced in order to power these scrubbers and electrostatic precipitators. And here's the last slide for the day. Really, in the end, nope, not your last slide, my fault, but really in the end, reducing the amount of smog and other pollutions is the best scenario. Now, smog, like we talked about, is a secondary pollutant, which means that it is the result of primary pollutants coming together and forming something different. The chemicals, the primary pollutants that form smog, can't really be reduced using the technologies that we just talked about. Remember, the components of smog are going to be nitrogen oxides and VOCs. So the best way to reduce your smog is to reduce the amount of VOCs released and the amount of nitrogen oxides released. And there's a lot of strategies for doing this that we'll talk about on the next slide. But uh, just kind of stick in the back of your head that the best way to reduce photochemical smog is to reduce the amount of VOCs and nitrogen in the atmosphere so those things can't come together to form that smog in the first place. Wrapping up, I want to talk through some solutions for reducing the amount of pollution that gets out into the air period. Now, there are a bunch of different strategies. Here's some that you should be aware of. Um, one of them is to regulate pollution producing industries. So this is telling uh, power plants and other industries, you are allowed to produce X tons of carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxide. So it's just laying down a rule, letting the EPA regulate that industry and say this is how much you can put out. Another way that you can reduce air pollution is to expand public transit because one of the major air polluters is going to be people driving their vehicles. So if you can take those people, get them out of their vehicles and onto public transit, that's fewer cars on the road, which means less pollution in the air. And you can also just straight restrict the use of cars. This has been done in some cities. So like Mexico City has done it, Beijing has done it. They've done things where they have said you can only drive your car every other day, so maybe on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, people with even-numbered license plates can drive, and then on the other days, people with odd-numbered license plates can drive. So obviously, this is going to cut the number of cars on the street in half. But if you're going to do that as a city, you need to provide a way for people to get around. So again, we've got public transit, but you could also look at doing something like a bike share, becoming very popular in America. And there's a lot of European cities that do this, where you've got you know bike rental stations or bike borrowing stations set up around the city. Pick your bike up, ride to where you need to go and leave the bike there. So that would be one strategy for getting people around city without using public transit or cars. 
You could also, if you're a city that has got toll roads, regulate the price of the tolls during different parts of the day. So maybe in the morning during rush hour, you could raise the tolls so that there are fewer people driving, and then when there are fewer cars on the road, you could lower the tolls so people would be incentivized to drive during those times and kind of spread out your traffic load. Last thing I want to talk about is cap and trade policies. This is something that has been tried and has been successful and has failed both, and we'll talk about that. So cap and trade policy is basically a government system where they tell a polluting industry you can emit X tons of pollution and they will give that industry so many allowances. So let's say they tell an industry you can emit 1,000 tons of pollution over the coming year. We are going to give you 1,000 allowances. So they would do that for each industry. Each industry would get a set number of allowances and then if the industry went over their allowances they would be penalized and then you've got all these allowances that different companies have got and they can buy and sell them to one another so let's say that one company knows that they are not going to meet their allowances they're going to stay under the amount of pollution that they are allowed to emit they will have extra allowances they can take those allowances and sell them to another industry that knows that they are going to go over their budget. So by creating this system, you are setting the set level of pollution that can be emitted because each company gets a certain number of allowances, but you're also allowing companies to adjust for their needs. Those that emit less pollution can make some side cash by selling their allowances, and those that make more pollution can avoid getting penalized by buying allowances. And then over time, the government can reduce the amount of allowances that are put out there so that you are gradually taking down the amount of pollution over time. Now, this was done successfully in America with sulfur emissions coming out of power plants. It was tried with carbon dioxide, but was struck down. Hopefully in the future, there will be some progress on getting some cap and trade policy going on with regard to carbon dioxide. So that's it. It's Monday morning. I know I fumbled over some words.